Welcome to the Church Collective Podcast. In this episode, we had the opportunity to talk to Mr. Philo, first in, last out himself, Todd Elliott. And it's just a fantastic conversation. You kind of get the balance of the worship ministry compared to like the technical arts ministry. At the end of the day, we're all trying to glorify God. And I think you're going to super love this. Make sure to check out everything that Philo has going on. You'll hear a bunch of it in this episode. But here we go with the Church Collective Podcast. Philo stands for uh, first in, last out. If you're an accountant, you know the term. If you're an industrial engineer, which I actually happen to be, you understand the, you know, like, uh, what is that supply chain uh, first in last out. But for us as technical artists in the local church, it sort of defines who we are. Um, we show up before anybody else, turn the lights on and we turn the lights off and we're the last out the door. So yeah. uh, just the name comes from the idea of, um, yeah, we, we tend to be the first in and the last out. And really the, for us as an organization, the, the goal is to um, help bring that community together. I mean, I spent a lot of years uh, wishing I had a community to connect with. And so people that understood me and, you know, uh, wore black, just like me and <laughs> sat in the back of the room yeah. and, you know, that we could be in a room and kind of laugh at all the same jokes about, you know, gaff tape versus duct tape or, you know, whatever the, yeah. whatever the exact thing was. Um, so community is a big part for us. And then um, skill development. So, you know, just getting better at what we do. There's churches out there that have done uh, pretty much everything that we can learn from. And that's really how I got better as a technical artist. And then just inspiration, you know, just hoping that we can help people realize that what they do matters and, you know, keep, keep going another year, you know, to, to say what you do is worth it. Um, yeah. So hang in there. Yeah. T tell me a little bit, like what, what's your, your story? Oh, geez. What's my story. So <laughs> uh, probably like a lot of tech people, um, I started, you know, in high school and this is going to date uh, kind of my age, but when the film projector was getting all warbly in the back, you know, <laughs> of the classroom, I would go back there and fix it. Um, yeah. Started uh, just uh, doing audio at my church, uh, mostly because, uh, my, one of my good friends, we were kind of sitting in the booth together and he was doing all the work, uh, which was all the work was one microphone and a tape deck to record. <laughs> he didn't show up one day and I'm like, well, I, I kind of watched him do it. So I think I can do this. Yeah. And then just that, as the church grew, you know, to two microphones and then a keyboard or a guitar or something, I just kind of learned as we went. Um, and so that's how I got into production in the local church. And, um, I had no, this is the, the eighties now we're talking. And so there was no, <laughs> there was really, I mean, you could probably count on one hand, how many churches had a production team or, right. You know, somebody who was being paid on staff to do, you know, technical stuff. So I had no concept that, Oh, well, maybe I could do this as a career. Um, yeah but I loved it. I mean, I just like, this is what I want to do. And, uh, uh, I went off to college, uh, just kind of, uh, thinking, well, it's in the back of my mind, but I got to go get a real job. So I went to school for industrial engineering. Um, and somewhere along the way, uh, somewhere my, maybe the end of my sophomore year, junior year, I thought I do not want to do this. Um, at a couple of internships uh, with engineering firms. I'm like, if this is what a job would be, I don't really want to do this. Hmm. Okay. So what do I do? Um, and sort of in that uh, kind of questioning, I was sitting down eating lunch by myself in my apartment in college. Yeah. And I was listening to um, brace yourself. Um, was listening to uh, Amy Grant's lead me on album. There you go produced by Brown Bannister. And I have to say, uh, Brown Bannister changed my life. Um, yeah, just the sound, the production value, the, and the, uh, the song All Right came on. So there's a huge choir, kind of the, the song builds to this, you know, giant choir. And I was like, this sounds amazing. And I need to figure out how to do this. Like, how can I create something like this? And I had no idea what that actually meant, but I thought, you know what, before I go off into industrial engineering land, I'm going to try to figure out how to be about this. Yeah. Um, and so 
I was serving at my church. Um, and you know, we started having conversations about how could I, you know, get involved? How could I, you know, do this for a job? Mm. And, um, it was a long, uh, sort of, it was a long conversation, but I ended up getting a job there. I made yeah. six grand a year. Um, right. Yeah, I was <laughs> pulling it down big time, yeah. but it was getting to do all the things, you know, create. And at that, that time, you know, it was like a homemade PA and, yeah. you know, SM58 microphones, you know, nothing, you know, totally amazing, but it was a great group of people. And I would even say the best mix of my life was in that in that area, you know, in that time frame, where just like, wow, it all came together. And it sounds like I imagined it in my head. Yeah. Um, you know, on, a, on this, you know, kind of substandard gear, but um, sure. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I'm like flying through my story, but the, yeah, I, so I was, was at this church for, um, 11 years on staff. So I was a volunteer. I jumped on board as a staff person in year two of the church. Um, so I helped kind of with the startup part of it. And, um, yeah, just went from mixing audio, which I thought I'm gonna, this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life to, okay, uh, now we need to do video overflow somehow. Uh, yeah. and again, this is like early nineties. So this is not like a normal thing like it is now. Yeah. So I'm like, well, I guess I'll do that. I got to figure out how to do that. And somebody else will mix audio. And I thought, oh man, I'm really going to miss this. Well, it turns out like directing video it has the same kind of uh like i got the same kind of joy from that you know like the perfect you know having mixing the camera shots just right to help tell a story filled the same kind of uh spot in my heart that the perfect mix did yeah um, and then i moved on to lighting and set design and turns out same thing kind of happened to me there i thought i would miss the video side of it and it turns out i loved the lighting and all that stuff and Pretty soon I figured out that, uh, now I'm leading people and, um, like I, I, not that I knew how to do any of that other stuff, you know, I just sort of made it up and taught myself, but the leading people is like, I don't know how to do this. I'm a, like, I'm not a button pusher, but like, you know, let me, let me do my thing, you know, by myself and get this working, um, and do something beautiful, but leading people, you know, it's just, it's messy and um, different than yeah. just worrying about yourself. Right. Um, and so really that's really, um, c coming back to like the heartbeat of Philo, that's where the idea, not the idea for Philo, but my own need for community and skill development and inspiration came from. It's just like, mm. wow, I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, so I just, I ended up, um, calling information, uh, back in those days, 411, if you remember that, uh, <laughs> it's like, Hey, can you give me the phone number to Saddleback church Yeah, and Willow Creek church? And just call that number. and like, Hey, do you have a tech person I could talk to? And just trying to make a connection with somebody who was further down the road than me that could give me some insight. And yeah. those relationships, uh, were so meaningful to me because well, number one, they would actually pick up the phone when I called. Mm -hmm. Um, and, they didn't necessarily have all the answers, but they, they had, um, they would even say, yeah, I haven't figured that out or we don't know how to handle that or whatever. Right. Um, which was all that even that by itself was helpful to me. Like, Oh, I'm not crazy. It's like a problem everywhere. Not just here. Right. Um, and then, so, uh, I, I was there, uh, on staff for about 11 years and I loved it and the people were great. And yeah, I couldn't have asked for a better, thing and in that moment of me feeling like oh man i got everything i could ever want god started like poking at me um and saying hey uh do you uh do you feel like i've asked people to follow me you know that's something i do leave everything and follow me yeah and maybe do you think it's possible i'm asking you to like leave all this and follow me yeah um which was really the hardest thing i've ever done it still feels like in retrospect, it still feels like the hardest struggle of my life uh, in a way uh, wrestling with God, but he's done it to me a few times along the way. But sure. so I was like, all right, I, my wife and I got to a place where, okay, we trust you. We, if you were actually asking us to leave everything, we would follow you. And turns out he was asking us to leave everything. And so we 
moved to Chicago from Detroit area and started working at Willow Creek um, mm. on the production team there. And um, yeah, I had, uh, had a great experience uh, at Willow Creek, uh, 11 years I was on staff or nearly. Uh, so I have an 11 year cycle uh, of work, I guess. <laughs> um, so I'm in year eight of 11. So I don't know what's going to happen. And uh, see where it goes from there. Yeah. Years, but, um, <laughs> right. Anyway, Get back to engineering. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, I hope not. Um, but the um, anyway, so was, yeah, here at uh, Willow Creek had some very amazing experiences that, you know, um, have just have really helped shape me. But the big thing that I, I noticed when I got here you know, this whole idea of like gathering with tech people and, you know, oh gosh, I'm not alone or other people are dealing with this coming to start working here at Willow Creek, which, you know, in those days, the early two thousands, there's a, there was a sense that, oh, they got it all figured out and things are perfect over there yeah. getting here being like, oh, wow, they have the exact same challenges I had at the church right. in Detroit. Yeah. Maybe there are more of them because it's bigger, but they're the same challenges. And so that really, led me, uh, you know, to start thinking differently about, um, okay, if I need this and Willow Creek needs this, then it's probably a good chance that every tech person, you know, kind of has these similar challenges. So how right. do we, pull, how do we, how do we resource tech people better? Um, yeah. Yeah. So man, was, yeah, like I said, they're 11 <laughs> years and then left, uh, yeah. 2014 just felt like God was saying, Hey buddy, um, it's time for something new. And I had no idea what it was. I just yeah. left. Okay. So I wouldn't recommend that to anybody to just quit your job and not have a plan, but that's what I did. My wife somehow thought it was a good idea too. Um, yeah. And here we are. We're in Philo a year eight. Crazy. Yeah. I'd love to like, even going a little bit back there, like you, you kind of got into church production in its very, very infancy. Like, so if you're, if you're inspired by Amy Grant and stuff, I'd wonder like, what made you decide to run for church production versus like, well, maybe I'll do touring with artists or I'll try to get into album recording. Cause that was kind of, that was the core of the production stuff at the time. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I honestly, it was just a lack of knowledge. Like I had no concept of touring. I had no mm -hmm. idea that, um, that church production was a thing. I mean, actually it wasn't back then. Yeah the the reality of recording i'd never done any of it or at sure. least not anything everything i'd done up to that point was live and so i had no no relationships in the recording industry the only thing i had was i had a roommate whose grandparents lived in franklin tennessee yeah and so we went up to visit one time like we got to hit all these recording studios that i've read <laughs> about you know in the liner notes of all these ccm recordings that i love yeah. Um, but didn't know anybody there. And I think yeah. just uh, being involved in the local church and them, you know, our conversations about, move, you know, how could I do something job related? Uh, yeah. So early on, I think that's how I ended up going in that direction. And sure. maybe also too, as part of my story, I didn't, um, I wasn't only doing production work at the beginning. So I was like, it was a pretty small staff. And so you, kind of everybody was doing everything. And one of the things that I did was uh, I wrote out the charts for the band and vocalists every week. Yeah. <laughs> so there was no online thing to dig into. Right. So like, all right, listen to this Stephen Curtis Chapman album and just basically transcribe every song. Um, so <laughs> that's uh, great. Yeah, <laughs> that's super fun. Yeah, even to this day, if I if one of those tracks comes on, I like I could tell you every horn hit and you know, yeah. uh, vocal backup, vocal, uh, rhythm, you know, just like you still hear it all in my head. Yeah. That's awesome. Do you, you were taught like, so you really learned as you jumped in and learned as you went, I'd love to hear your thought being so involved with like so many technicians and production people. Do, do you think, uh, are, are more people like training to become one? Like, do they plan to be one when they grow up or it just feel like most everybody kind of falls into it and then learns as they go? Like, is there any balance between the two of those things? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, you know, uh, I had the luxury of uh, starting doing production work at a church that had nothing. Yeah. And so I was like, well, uh, I'm the most knowledgeable person here. And so yeah. yeah. If I can't, a lot, a lot of people's story. Can. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, that's so a very common like, story. Yeah. And then just sort of grew with it. Um, 
which, uh, you know, on some level, technology has become so complicated. It's not something you can, uh, there are so many, it's so few opportunities to grow into something yeah. uh, because it's already big and complicated. But I would say um, every person that I work with now, and this may be an overstatement, learned by doing and Maybe they went to school along the way, but there was already a foundation of, I was just a kid and I jumped in helping, you know, at VBS, um, you know, behind the console and just kind of uh, learned as I went. Yeah. And to me, I think in, in a similar way to a musician, you know, there's a part of it that, yeah, you can go to school for it, but to get into school, you've already got to have some sort of aptitude yeah. that came from somewhere. Right. And that somewhere is from practicing and experiences. And, and I think in a, in a way, uh, production work is more of a trade than it is, a um, whatever the opposite of that is, yeah. you know, it's like, you, you, you <laughs> yeah. get good at it by doing it. And so, right. um, yeah, well, I, it's, it's one of the paradoxes of the, of the local church is that we want, um, from a production standpoint, we want consistency and excellence and, but we, we also need to develop a team and create space for people to learn and grow and make mistakes. And, and, um, but every healthy church environment that I can think of, they're, they're growing their people up from within by giving them opportunities to, um, learn how to mix audio, to learn how to do lights, um, and, uh, yeah, it's just a challenge to figure out how do you do both things? Right. Um, yeah. Cause they feel mutually exclusive in some ways. Yeah. True. Yeah. Um, you talked about like, we are coming learning from these big churches like Saddleback, Willow Creek, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, uh, yeah. what, like they didn't know the answers to a lot of this stuff, like is what you discovered. And I think even now we would all say that, like, what, what are some of the questions you're facing or not you, but like what you know, the production people were like, what do you think we're facing in 2022 is church production? Like what, what are our big questions right now that we don't really, that we probably yeah, don't have answers. I mean, I, <laughs> like, I maybe say, you got yeah, some answers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would say the big questions have really nothing to do with technology. Mm. They have all to do with self-leadership yeah. relationship with whoever your counterpart is, a worship pastor, a senior pastor, um, trust between kind of the platform uh, team and the back of how, you know, the front of house team. Yeah. Um, those to me, uh, and I mean, honestly, the, um, if I look back on my journey, that was always my biggest question mark. Yeah. How do I, how do we do this better? How do we, get along better? How do we trust each other more? And I was yeah. always surprised that nobody else was talking about it. Yeah. Um, you know, go to a conference or whatever. I'm like, Oh, we're talking about numbers and gear and, you know, model yeah. numbers, but how do you like, I just don't understand my worship leader. So like, how do I do that better? <laughs> right. Um, and so to me, I feel like those are still the biggest, uh, challenges of, uh, f local church, um, yeah. Production team, worship team, and, you know, uh, figuring out how to do this better together. Yeah. Um, especially cause we're wired up so differently. Right. Um, or have the potential to be wired up differently. And, um, yeah, it feels because we're so different and it feels like we're always butting heads, but we're just coming at a, you know, um, a challenge from different perspectives. And so, it feels like butting heads, but it's really just like, I'm, I'm looking at this from a different perspective than you are. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. How do we, how do we learn to trust that um, better? Yeah. Sheesh. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Well, you figured yeah. out, we'll, we'll let everyone know. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, there's still no answer for it other right. than hard work and putting the time in. And yeah, I mean, I think put, making, making space for relationship outside of the task at hand. Yeah. Um, Cause I think the, the, right now so much of our relationship is built around a stressful three or four hour period on a Sunday. Yeah. Um, and there's no time for anything else versus let's go have coffee and right. How many kids do you have? And, and <laughs> you know, yeah, those types of things. Um, 
or is, that's what builds trust, not just working harder on Sunday. Yeah. So for those of you that are like that are listening, you may not be aware uh, of Todd's name, but I'm sure you know of his book. So I'd love Todd to tell us, tell us about your book. That, that thing has just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's been, uh, it's so I'm a tech person. I like sitting in the back. <laughs> I like you, I like uh, not being, uh, drawn attention to I'm a, I'm classic. Uh, so the fact that I've written a book, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> still kind of weird to me. Um, but uh, yeah, so the book is called I Love Jesus, But I Hate Christmas. <laughs> and it's really, um, uh, yeah, just kind of says what it, <laughs> what a tech person feels in the local church. So it's like, I mean, I, it's a lot of work. And so how do we survive it? You know, yeah. uh, and, and I sort of I hate the kind of cliche, like instead of just thrive, you know, uh, surviving, how do we thrive? But that's really right. the, yeah. the idea. It's like, how do how do I live a more effective life myself so that I can do this thing that, yeah. that, um, you know, that God's designed me for. Um, and so, yeah, the writing it, um, it was, a, uh, for any of you listening who have written anything, you know, that it's kind of excruciating to have mm-hmm. to write all the things down. Um, but, uh, I just felt like these similar to me coming to Willow Creek and realizing, wow, these things that I'm struggling with and, that uh that i'm learning apply here as much as they do anywhere else and so yeah i just thought you know what i'm going to write all this stuff down and if it's it was really good for me to um kind of solidify what i think about uh what i do which was super helpful but and then i just thought well if this helps somebody else then that's a bonus um yeah and so um yeah the short chapters, a lot of discussion questions. Um, yeah, just the idea is to generate conversation on your team about how are we doing teamwork? How are we doing production? How are we leading our teams? Um, so, yeah. um, yeah. What, what, what is it about like the Christmas and Easter productions? Um, trying to see how to frame it. Like, do you think we, we as churches reach too far? Or do you mm-hmm. think it's uh, we're grinding? Like, what, what do you what do you think makes Christmas sure. so so difficult? Like, I think we all would say we want to go for the big stuff, yeah, but yeah. then when you talk to people, it always feels like, oh man, we're doing you know not enough budget, not enough people. Like everybody feels like we're going too far. Sure, that's that's not always just the senior pastor. Sometimes it's ourselves, right. like yeah, challenging right. ourselves. I want to yeah. do something cool, yeah. Right. So, yeah. yeah, and I think uh, so I have two thoughts on Christmas and Easter. Um, and I'll probably forget the second one, uh, after I talk about the first one, but the first one is really the thing about Christmas and the process of getting ready for Christmas and all that stuff. It's like a pressure cooker. And so what ends up happening is all the things we do really well, every other day of the year, every other weekend, we, they're even bet, you know, they're magnified and even better, like on that event the things we stink at or we don't invest in those things also are magnified at Christmas and Easter. So if you have a tough relationship with your counterpart, guess what? It's going to be even harder at Christmas. Right. Um, If you have trouble with boundaries with your time, you know, on, you know, the third week in March, you're going to have trouble with boundaries at Christmas time, which means (laughs) you're never going to go home. Right. Um, And so really for me, the, this one of the secrets to having a better Christmas experience is to start on January 1st mm-hmm. with like building processes and boundaries in all of our lives on how we do work together. Yeah. Um, so that Christmas and Easter are better. I think the other part of it too is, and I used to, um, I used to think that this was a church thing, but it turns out it's just the doing something new and unique is hard work. And especially if you're, tr- if it's new, it means you really have no idea how long it's going to take, how much money it's going to cost. You're just kind of educated guessing your way through it. Yeah. And that's hard. And right. so if we want to be about doing something new and creative and, uh, you know, beautiful and wonderful for our people, it's going to, that comes with a little bit of unknown and stretching. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, when I think about the really hard stuff that I've been a part of, yeah, some of it's a bad memory, but the other part of it is, oh, remember that time we ziplined the senior pastor from the balcony? 
right. Yeah. I mean, it's a great memory. That's that, you know, it's, um, I had a pastor once tell me that, you know, those moments that people will go home remembering that is hopefully attached to the good news of the gospel. Yeah. Um, that's what we pay rent for. Like that's why we're on staff. That's why we built a building so right. that we're, we're creating moments that people are connecting with God. And if that means yeah, zip lining the senior pastor in from the balcony is part of that, mm. then um, yeah, let's, let's go for it. Right. Yeah. That's killer. What, um, let's, let's talk about the Philo event. Like how, how long have you been doing that? You know, I know I just I was a part of one a couple months ago. Incredible. Absolutely yeah. loved it. Oh, thanks, yeah. Uh, but yeah, tell, tell me a little bit about them. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, this is uh, probably uh, more information than you want. But um, back in the 2000s, when I was uh, still in Detroit, uh, I was having this feeling like, oh, man, we should like just gather people together and share ideas. And so yeah. uh, so I sent out a postcard. Again, this was the 90s or, you know, it was, like, <laughs> it was mostly pre uh, pre Internet, sent out a postcard to like churches in a 20 mile radius and said, yeah. hey, we're going to gather at our church Thursday night. Just come. We'll share ideas, you know, production folks. And 250 people came mm. and wow. they <laughs> spent most of the time staring at me like, all right, give us info. <laughs> like to show and us. Thought, yeah. Oh, geez, this is not what I, I wanted to like be a part of this, not. Uh, have right. to, you know, do it. But that really was the beginning. I think that was 2002. Um, yeah. This of this idea of like, all right, I mean, people need it. So how can we, you know, how can we help resource these folks? So uh, coming to Willow Creek, that, so did that a few years and then came to Willow Creek and was a part of the arts conference uh, back in those days. Yeah. And when that ended in 2009, a year went by and I was just like, this is not cool that like we have this, we have a team here on the production side that so knowledgeable, so full of wisdom. We need to figure out how to do, how to help resource the local church um, beyond just doing weekend services. Like we had, yeah. I felt like we had the capacity for it. Yeah. So we, we started doing this. Uh, we sort of jumped on a little bit of a bandwagon with uh, this group called gurus of tech. Okay. Uh, so it was a group of tech people meeting during the NAB conference in Vegas uh, at Central Christian Church. Um, yeah. Just like, yeah, let's hang out and share ideas. And so we uh, we we turned it into a, a conference Willow Creek style um, in starting in 2011. Yeah. Uh, and so we did that for a few years and it was basically the same format as Philo, which is, you know, main session talks and worship and skill development breakouts. And yeah. so when we, st we stopped doing that version in 2014, which was also the year that I ended up quitting my job here at Willow. Um, yeah. And I'm like, well, I think this is probably, this is in my blood now, this whole idea of gathering tech people together. And I've seen that the last year of gurus of tech, we had 1600 people or something like that come. Well, yeah. I'm like, well, let's try it. Let's see if we can do it. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, started 2015 then and did four events in four cities, okay. one day events. Yeah. Um, and it basically, you know, the, being a production person, usually, uh, like somebody else has the big idea and I'm just trying to execute it. Yeah. Uh, turns out Philo is my big idea and I needed to execute it, but the pressure <laughs> of like, is it going to work? Is it what people need? You know, the stuff that I've never, uh, you know, in air quotes cared about before. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, doing that four times in a year was like too much for me. So yeah, and we just said, let's make it, let's do a two day event once a year. And so 2016 was the first year of that. And yeah, so we've been doing that uh, kind of ever since with the COVID interruption of <laughs> right. online uh, version. Yeah. Um, but even the all online version helped us reach um, groups of people around the world that would not have normally come to Philo just because it costs sure. prohibitive. Um, <laughs> right. And so now we're still doing um, an online version for people in India and uh, Africa and South America. And yeah, it's yeah. been really fun to see. Yeah. See God use our little thing. Yeah. Crazy. You know, further than just locally. Right. From your vantage point, what do you think COVID 
taught the church or did like we all we all got real busy for sure but like what if coming out of it what have we yeah what did we pick what up we what should learned? we leave behind yeah <laughs> oh geez uh i i mean i think we you know the the church as a whole probably figured out that the tech person matters more than we thought Very right. yeah. um i think also though the 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 craziness of covid and what it meant for tech people uh, i think um I think the thing I would love to leave behind is like you as a person are worth it. You're you matter because of who you are, not because of what you do. And yeah. that, that it's okay to um, not work 80 hours a week or, you know, whatever the craziness that you're doing. And even, I, I just think uh, for me, I'll just speak for me as a tech person, I don't want to let anybody down. I also like saving the day every now and then. Um, <laughs> yeah. and so those two things make it really hard to, you know, uh, keep control of your life. Um, right. But, but you can't keep it up. You can't sustain it. You, um, you need a break. Um, yeah. And I think on many levels, I think it's up to each of us. It's not our, ch it's not, it's not all on the organizations. Um, right. Cause I felt like my church was uh, asking me to work, you know, seven days a week at a one point in my life. And the senior pastor's like, no, nobody's asking you to work that hard. Right. Um, that's on you. And <laughs> you need to, if you need a, if you need two days off or whatever, you need to, you need to figure it out. Um, right. And uh, yeah, it's just that that's super formative for me. That happened early on, but sure. I think, it's um it's important to know that okay we there is a lot to do and we can't do everything so right take care what of would yourself. what would you say to the i can hear the production guy listening to this and saying oh take a day off like oh, there's too many things to do that i have to sure. do uh right. what, what do you say to that person <laughs> well i think that one of the things that really helped me in uh in the span <laughs> of my life as a tech person was really the what nobody knows what I'm doing anyway. Like the, the senior pastor doesn't really know what's involved. The worship leader doesn't know what's involved. I know. Yeah. And so because it's a mystery to everyone, like they're wondering, is this even a full-time job or what do you do every day? You know, the, right. we get those kinds of questions. I think um, when you say to somebody, your boss who doesn't totally get what you do, Hey, I'm, I'm working too hard, or this is you know, too many hours or whatever they just don't know what that means. It's too nebulous because yeah. it's already a mystery to them. Right. So part of, for me, it was, uh, I spent a season of time where I kept track of every hour that I was, do, what am I doing? Yeah. And maybe it was even in 15 minute increments. It took me three hours to do this and two hours to do that. And, and just started keeping track of what is 40 or 50 hours look like. Yeah. So that I could tell my boss, hey, this is what I'm spending time on, like actually, not just right. an idea. Yeah. And so let's talk about what of this is important and what isn't. Yeah. And then the beauty of it was when somebody would ask for something extra, I could then show them this list. Okay, here's what I'm I'm already doing this. What do you want me to not do to, to add that thing? Right. Um, or maybe like, okay, for this week, we just need to add it, uh, and not subtract. But, but I, I think instead of me taking the responsibility at every moment to figure out what's the most important, it, uh, for me to spend my time on, it was really a game changer for me to say, help me decide how you want me to do this. Yeah. Um, because we can't do everything. Right. Um, and so I, for me, it's, yes, there's a lot to do. And guess what? The list will never go away. It's always going to be there. And so I think it, it's really important to include your, your boss or your supervisor in on the decision of, Hey, I need to like, uh, work a normal amount of hours. So help me decide right. what to, what to let go of. Yeah. Something I hear often too is, um, because it's so specialized a lot of, especially like front of house, like they want to train somebody. But like the bar is so high that they can't necessarily get somebody involved, let alone have the time to like be able to do it. 
Um, can you maybe right. speak to how valuable training is, you know, where yeah. do we all need to be making decide? Like I biblically, we should all make disciples, but sometimes right. we're hired to just do our role, you know, yeah. very technical. Yeah, yeah. Like, so maybe speak to that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think there's on one hand, I totally get that if you have somebody that's mixing front of house every week, that you're going to get a consistent mix every week. That's going to right. sound the same. I think that, uh, that that's valuable. Um, is it the most valuable? I mean, I would say for a lot of really great engineers that I know, um, at a certain point, you know, you can only get so be- so much better. Yeah. Like at a certain point, you could spend hours to get like 1% more out of the system or whatever. Yeah. And for me, uh, at that point, it becomes like, what if you spent those hours like developing someone? Sure. Uh, pouring into someone, uh, letting somebody sit with you at front of house. Um, I think um, uh, there's a gentleman, Andrew Stark, who used to be uh, the audio, the head of audio for Hillsong. Uh, uh-huh. This is going back a few years. And he realized that like, you know, the perfect mix is not enough for me. Uh, and so developing people became his passion. How can I pass on all this knowledge I have to someone else? And so he just started doing it uh, without uh, anybody asking him to, and just had people with him at front of house. Yeah. And it got to the point where maybe everyone on the platform thought Andrew was mixing, but it turns out it was this, it was a volunteer every week and Andrew was just standing back there. Right. And so the, um, you know, people look back in the booth and like, Oh, there's a little bit of feedback, but Andrew's back there. It'll be fine. Yeah. So he, he created an environment where people could be developed solely over time. Um, and I think too, um, there's a guy, Dave Ferguson, who leads the exponential movement. Yeah. Um, a pastor here in Chicago. He talks about this idea of excellence and development, uh, instead of them being mutually exclusive, they're like pedals on a bicycle hmm. that to move our, uh, you know, the church forward, we need to be excellent. So we push on that pedal and we need to develop. We push on that pedal. We can't push on them at the same time. We won't go anywhere, mm-hmm. but that we're, we're yeah. spending time, uh, you know, just pushing on each value. And so, yeah, I think yeah, for me, um, yeah, development is the key and, and we have to create a culture that, that mistakes, uh, or maybe more specifically first time mistakes are, part of the part of the deal yeah um because i benefited from making all kinds of mistakes the first sure. time where yeah <laughs> you know, it's like well no one else is going to do it better so i guess we're okay with that mistake right to now it's like well everybody notices when the mic's not on but if we're okay learning from it yeah let's throw people in and um help them develop right we do, as we kind of get ready to wrap up here, what encouragement do you find yourself giving production people lately or like what, what kind of like, what kind of blessing do you have for everybody listening? So we got oh, techs, wow. worship leaders. Yeah. People in the trenches doing church. <laughs> like yeah. I think there's a bunch of insight, but like, what, what would you encourage them in today? Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, maybe I would go back to something I said a little bit earlier is that like who you are, who God made you to be matters and mm-hmm. God, God wants you to th- to thrive in who you are not just for a year or two but for your life yeah. and if we're not more careful of taking care of ourselves we're just going to burn out and be of no use um to the kingdom and not that it's all about being used but um yeah i think there's beauty in being involved in the local church and yeah. uh it's not it won't ha- happen automatically if we don't kind of lead ourselves in uh, self-care and yeah. uh, and investing in relationships for the long term. Yeah, that's great. Everybody do that. Do <laughs> Focus that. on that. Yeah, yeah do so that. Easy. You got it. Yeah, just do right. that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. As always, find us on whatever social media you're on. Find us. We are having a blast everywhere. Shoot us a DM. Uh, Let's say this week the secret word is Millennium Falcon. If you've made it all the way to the end of this episode, go ahead and DM us the word Millennium Falcon, and it'll certainly make our day, and we'll see what happens. Okay? God bless.